Thank you very much, Jeff, for this very, very kind uh, introduction and also the invitation to be here. It's been a marvelous time already for me. I've been here two, two days and it's been spectacular days. I mean, I think you all agree that this center is, is really, really extraordinary and it is because Jeff himself is very extraordinary. I think the combination works extremely well and I'm really privileged to be here and to share with you some of the, some of the knowledge we gained over the last uh, 10 years into uh, biomarkers. So I called it diagnosing AD before dementia. You've heard this morning already that that was one of the most sort of striking uh, new developments over the last uh, couple of years that we are moving this diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease before the stage of dementia. I'm particularly thrilled about that and I think that this really will advance the field even more. So this is the, the outline and uh, I'll talk about early diagnosis, I'll talk a little bit about the new concept and I'll, I'll briefly take you through all the biomarkers, CSF, PET and, and MRI and hopefully come to some meaningful conclusions. And since Jeff mentioned the Queen, I thought I'd send you, a, I'll, I'll show you her. This is actually, not to be mistaken, this is the Queen actually here. Um, she always wears a hat, she's very famous for that. Um, and uh, this is me, as you can see, and we're toasting here with a glass of wine. And this was at the opening of, of the new center, which is uh, architecturally very nice, but is not to be compared with, with what we are here. And it's quite small also, smaller than, than here. But we are very proud of it. And for me, it is the only and the very first center that is separate in the hospital that you could recognize from outside. And I think that's very important. We are used to have epilepsy center or cancer centers, but Alzheimer's disease is such an important disease that in my mind, it deserves a, a, a center by itself. And we created that. And I think uh, this one is also a very good example of how the important this disease is and how centers like this can actually make the difference. So um, this is just to, to illustrate, this is the World Alzheimer's Report the, and Alzheimer's Disease International every year brings out a report with important figures and facts, etc. And in 2011, the report dealt with early diagnosis. And there is an important statement here that they make is that an early diagnosis can be achieved by, by various means, by practice-based educational programs in primary care, as we are doing now, actually, the introduction of accessible diagnostic and early-stage dementia care services. There are, very, there are too few of them in the world, actually, like memory clinics, and also an effective interaction between different components of the health system. That is also needed for an early diagnosis. And I think, very, very importantly, they make a statement that there is a it's a myth, actually, that there is no point in early diagnosis. And I've been sort of long enough in the field to know that, especially among G general practitioners, maybe more in Europe than in the US, I wouldn't know, that there is some skepticism and almost nihilistic approach to Alzheimer's and dementia because there's nothing you can do about it. So why would you diagnose it earlier? Why would you even bother? And I think this has to change and it will change. And especially if we have new drugs, of course, coming along, but already now patients that are seeing us and looking for us for advice, they, you can't push them. You can't send them back in the bush, as we say in the Netherlands and say, well, you, I think you have dementia, it doesn't bother what kind of or what it is, just to relax and go home and see me in another year. No, patients want to know exactly because they know what has been going on and the caregivers know exactly what is going on and they want to know what it is and what the future is. So I think that's a very important statement and it also calls for action for all the governments in the world to do something about it. So in the early days, as you've seen here, I haven't seen Alois Alzheimer today on any presentation, so I'm happy to, to show him to you. He was a German psychiatrist and neurologist and anatomist, and he was actually everything, he did everything. And in 1906, he presented the first case of Alzheimer's disease in a 51-year-old uh, woman, actually. He followed her for five years in the clinic. We can't do that in the Netherlands anymore. Um, and he followed her every day and he made notes every day and all these notes are, are sort of saved they are kept and you can actually look at them and he made very careful observations of the course of dementia very worthwhile reading i would say and of course he was famous be describing the neuropathology of alzheimer's disease so in 1984, and between 1906 and 1984, in those 70 years, actually very little happened. 
and that's very strange also. And uh, I think from uh, 84, from the very first clinical criteria, McCann, Jeff mentioned it actually, it was only then it was possible to make a clinical diagnosis. And I think if you realize this, this is just over 25 years ago, how young the field of Alzheimer's disease is. So it's not surprising that we don't have a therapy if you compare it with oncology. We just started. But in 84, this diagnostic criteria meant that you could diagnose a disease by excluding all other diseases. And if everything was excluded, the patient may have probable Alzheimer's disease. And I think it has, been, it has served this purpose. We had done clinical trials. But as you know, these criteria are not specific, not at all, uh, and not that sensitive also. So by diagnosing patients with these criteria, you may actually include other types of dementia that fulfill these criteria also. So that's another reason why maybe therapeutic trials have failed, because basically there was a lot of mixed dementias or other dementias in those trials. So we need better criteria. We need to be more specific, and specifically we need to address the underlying pathology. We need to know what's happening in the brain when a patient comes to you with a memory problem or anything else. So that's why Bruno Dubois and, and myself and, and Jeff and a whole lot of other people in the International Working Group sat together and proposed these criteria. And this was research criteria and not clinical criteria. And we went on from sort of identifying the main problem, which is memory impairment, as you heard this morning also, and adding evidence from biomarkers to increase the likelihood that the underlying pathology is actually Alzheimer's disease. So I think this has a tremendous impact on the field. We are, we are just realizing how tremendous this impact is at the moment. And as Jeff said, there are other criteria by the NIA which basically are not that different, and they also have sort of the biomarker components to it. So, just briefly, the memory is central, it's pivotal, and as you heard this morning, there are patients who have Alzheimer's disease who don't have a memory problem or present themselves with different problems. I think that's a very important notion to take away. But basically, sort of, sort of the standard clinical practice is that a patient is a memory problem. But when the memory problem is there, he already sort of has, has gone through a phase which is called pre-symptomatic, and there were memory complaints perhaps, but not that subtle, not that deficit. And once you are in a dementia, the memory doesn't get worse. But a lot of things have happened before that. So memory tests are important, but they are not identifying the underlying cause. And that is when you need biomarkers. So we'll briefly go through MRI, we'll CSF, and PET for using uh, as a biomarker. This is a um, a publication we did a couple of years ago with Giovanni Frizzoni showing the, the, the amount of the type of measurements you can do entorhinal cortex atrophy, hippocampal atrophy, temporal neocortex atrophy, whole brain atrophy, ventricular enlargements. You can look at several items on the MRI. But here again, I mean, basically what you see happening over the course of the disease, pre symptomatic MCI, Alzheimer's, that most of these measurements tend to occur and tend to change relatively late. And that is because structural change only is happening when you have enough neuronal damage and, and neurons have gone lost, then there is volume loss, and then you see it on your MRI. So by definition, it's not a very early marker, but it's an important marker. And if you look here, this is, this is a coronal slices, very important. Always when you order an MRI scan for a dementia evaluation, always order a coronal T1. If anything you order, order this one. And if you follow the patient over time, you can see, you can appreciate actually the shrinkage of the hippocampus over time. And this is going from MCI to AD, and you see the shrinkage not only in the hippocampus, of course, but also in the rest of the brain. And this is uh, very sort of uh, prominently seen. Medial temporal lobe atrophy, hippocampal atrophy, is a predictor of underlying Alzheimer's disease in patients with MCI. This is a study that we did in, in a cohort in the vitamin E study that Ron Peterson led. And in, at baseline, we looked at all the scans together with uh, Giovanni Frizzoni and Charlie De Carli. Uh, and actually, what is depicted here is the, the difference between patients who had a normal hippocampus at baseline and the ones who already had some hippocampal atrophy at baseline while being diagnosed with MCI. Those were the ones who actually converted or progressed to Alzheimer's disease. So 
hippocampal atrophy at the time that you diagnose a patient with NCI is a predictor of ongoing pathology and also symptomatic Alzheimer's disease later on. And this is within three years' time. And you see the hazard ratio is more than 2.3, so it's a really risk for having hippocampal atrophy at baseline in MCI. But as we know, before um, uh, things like hippocampal atrophy occur, there is pathology ongoing. And in fact, the pathology starts somewhere here, maybe 10, 15 years before the first uh, complaints, and it gradually evolves, and then you have uh, complaints, actually. So something is happening before. And what is happening before is, of course, has to do with the amyloid process, the amyloid deposition in plaques, and also the oligomeric uh, changes that occur. And one way to look at that is with CSF. You can look at A-beta-42, you can look at tau, and you look at phosphotau. And those latter two markers are more neural injury markers. They will sort of release in the CSF when there is neuronal death. And A-beta-42 is basically a reflection of what is going on in the brain. And the more plaques and the more aggregation you get, the lower the A-beta-42 is in the CSF. So that's why a low A-beta CSF and a high tau, that combination is quite specific for the underlying ongoing process. And here you can see, if you combine the two, you have a sensitivity of more than 90% and a specificity of over 80%. And be careful, all these studies have been done with the clinical diagnosis as the endpoint. So you have to sort of, in, in a way, also take this with a grain of salt because no biomarker can ever be better than the clinical diagnosis if you use the clinical diagnosis in the studies as an endpoint. But I will show you later on that there's also pathology studies on the going and on the way now actually to show that the evidence is actually even better for CSF. So the combination of A-beta and tau in CSF, and just to make one remark because it was mentioned, in our country and actually in the Nordic countries, CSF lumbar puncture is quite a standard routine procedure. In my memory clinic, every patient undergoes an LP just before and after they get a cup of coffee, and it is either before or after the MRI or in between the neuropsychology and MRI. We just do it with a very, very thin needle, and actually the percentage of patients who get a post lumbar puncture headache is below 10%. So it's, it's a very well-to-do procedure. It's cheap, actually, and also the assessments, the A-beta-tau, phosphotau, in the CSF is, is very cheap if you compare it to PET. We have a, we have a lot of experience. As you can see, we, put, we compiled here a couple of years ago almost 1,700 patients, and we looked at the results. And we also had, and in 10% of the patients, we had pathology. 17 out of the 1,700 is not a big deal, but we are working on it to get more specimens, actually. And you can see here that the AD profile, so low A-beta, high tau, was actually correctly classifying 92% of the AD population in our center. And also importantly, it ruled out AD in more than 60% of the patients who didn't have AD. And the best combination, again, is A-beta 42 and phosphotau. That's the most specific one, actually. And here you have a list, maybe you, can, you cannot see it. Interestingly, we had two patients, actually, who we clinically probably misdiagnosed as uh, cortical basal degeneration, an FTD, actually, but the CSF profile was AD, and the pathologist also found mixed pathology. He found hippocampal sclerosis, but also BRAC2 to 3 stage Alzheimer pathology, which is very interesting because then the CSF A-beta tau profile already was positive, while the patient was only at BRAC2-3 stage. So it's a very early marker, actually. The same for this patient. We misdiagnosed them at cortical basal degeneration. The pathology in the CSF was AD. And indeed, the pathologist found a PSP diagnosis, but also, together with that, mixed pathology found Alzheimer's pathology, which was picked up by the, uh, the CSF. So CSF is not only to diagnose AD, but also to diagnose the component of AD, which is in the brain, when you have a, a different clinical profile. So you have these patients that have a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but there may be an Alzheimer's disease component to it, and this is what you can pick up with CSF. Um, this is just a summary, and it's, it's a very handy one. This you can look up in Neurology 2012, very recent, is just to sum up with how do these markers behave in um, in AD, FTD, DLB, vascular dementia, cortical basal, kreutzfeldt jakob PSP, and psychiatric disorders. And interestingly, some of them have also a low A-beta by itself. And this may mean two things. Um, 
we may have been wrong, these diagnoses, some of them may have been wrong, the clinical diagnosis may be wrong and CSF may be right, or there are two different pathologies uh, in that same patient and the phenotype is different. So we may have said FTD phenotype, but there may have been a low A beta, so there may be combined pathology or a wrong diagnosis. And you see that the, the tau actually is usually normal, except in CGG, of course, and phospho tau is probably quite specific because you see it in Alzheimer's disease only, and very rarely you see it in DLB and other dementias. And that's why the combination of A beta and phospho tau is the most specific to use in the differential diagnosis. Jeff also showed you the MCI predictive value in uh, CSF. This is the Hansen study. Actually, there is now a second study uh, showing the 10-year follow-up of this particular group of patients in Sweden, and this is very powerful. I mean, if you look at the graph in blue, are the patients who had a diagnosis of MCI, but with normal CSF, normal A beta, normal tau, and they stayed normal. They didn't progress to AD. So that's the other side of the coin. Normal CSF also means no clinical progression, while abnormal CSF meant clinical progression in almost all patients in five years' time, except a few. So it's a very powerful predictor for ongoing Alzheimer's disease pathology in patients who have only a memory problem in MCI. Um, here is another, it's a multi-center pooling of data, actually we also participate in this. This is a 750 MCI patients actually followed up for two years. And here you see of course there's a little bit of blurring of the data because this is multi-center from, from all over Europe, pooled data and pooled CSF analysis actually also. So here it, it is a little bit less uh, sort of um, important and less impressive, but still very nice sensitivity and specificity. Interestingly, we follow also a lot of patients who have subjective complaints, and that's a category of patients that come to our clinic complaining of a, a memory problem or another problem, which we screen completely and we say, we can't find anything. Neuropsychological test is completely normal, MRI is normal, everything is normal. But still, they have complaints. And we know from the literature that complaining of memory is a very good predictor of ongoing Alzheimer's disease or incipient Alzheimer's disease. And if you follow these patients, and we do CSF on all of them, you see that A beta 42, again, a low A beta 42 in a patient who has only complaints is also a very good predictor of clinical progression. So this is three years' time, and you see a hazard ratio of 15, actually, meaning that there is a, a high probability that patients who have a subjective complaint but have an abnormal A beta will go on to probably through the stage of MCI into the stage of dementia. And interestingly, you see that tau does really worse. And that's also logical because tau occurs later. But here, in our second study, we looked at what is predictive of the time to conversion. So A beta makes yes or no, you will convert, you will progress. But what is significant for the time to progression is in fact the markers like injury markers, like medial temporal lobe atrophy, tau, or even mini mental state examination. Those actually are more predictive of when. So indicating that if you have a patient with a memory problem with a low A beta and already a high tau, he will convert, but he will also rapidly convert within one or two years. While if tau is still normal, it will probably take some time. So he is underway, on the pathology way, he is not that far as a patient who has high tau. Still following? Yes? I, I know it's after lunch, but uh, even I get excited about it. Um, so then the new criteria, I mentioned them already, and since we have all those patients, and we do MRI, we do CSF, so we just look back to, in a sort of retrospective analysis, how would the criteria do actually in our clinic, in our population, if we look at it? And here we looked at the distinction between AD versus no dementia, or AD versus other dementias, and if you look at the criteria, so it's a memory problem plus MRI or CSF, so either one or the other, you have already a very nice specificity. So 95% of the patients was correctly identified having Alzheimer's disease three years later. And if you combine medial temporal lobe and CSF, so you put all the markers together, not surprisingly, you're actually your specificity is here 100%. So all patients were correctly identified. But at this cost, of course, 
to the sensitivity, which is now 48%, because you lose the patients in which not all three markers are positive. So you have lower sensitivity, but you have a very high specificity. So by employing all these biomarkers, you will actually reduce the amount of patients fulfilling those criteria, but the patients who do fulfill, they are very specifically having Alzheimer's disease pathology. And that is important for clinical trials, for instance. Better have less patients but with a correct diagnosis than have more patients in which you have a couple of misdiagnoses. Also, the predictive value I will show you. So, CSF. Important. Quite a nice sort of technique, actually not that uh, uh, expensive. But PET. PET was mentioned in our, in our criteria, as you can remember. Memory plus medial temporal atrophy, CSF, or PET. So I thought I should also spend a little bit of time on PET. And PET FDG, you will get a PET uh, scanner here, but FDG is very well known, also already used for many, many years. Um, and we all know this typical pattern, actually, of the parietal and uh, temporal hypometabolism that you can see. And we do too, and if you look at the, the studies, actually PET is very well studied, and also pathology studies, actually, they show up that you have a sensitivity of 94% and specificity of 73% and 78% versus other dementia. So it's also very good to rule out AD in that sense. And also important here, a negative FDG PET scan, so a normal PET scan, probably as a normal CSF also indicates no change over time in this particular study in a three-year follow-up. What we use actually is a very handy tool. We make FDG scans and we use a tool that was developed by Carl Helholz in the, in the, uh, in the section of a European study. It's a, it's a software tool that you compare your particular patient to 100 normal controls that are in the database. And what you then get is a VBM image actually, a voxel-based morphometry image, comparing your specific patients to the rest. And here in red is what is significantly different in your patient sort of compared to the, the normal 100 ones that are in the database. And this is a typical, also very important picture of Alzheimer's disease. It's the posterior cingulate hypometabolism, probably even earlier than the typical biparietal abnormalities. You see changes in the posterior cingulate on PET, FDG. And, excuse me, um, this automatic detection gives you, then maybe you can't read it, here you get a T statistics and the program just tells you that the, the chance that this patient has Alzheimer's disease is significant or it is normal. So this is very handy and it's very uh, useful. We use it a lot in the, in the clinic actually when we do FDG. And of course FDG is, is very helpful in cases of FTD. We will hear later of course. But here again, the sensitivity is not that high. You may have patients with a full-blown FTD clinical pictures who still have a normal FDG scan. It is possible, but when it's abnormal, then the diagnosis of FTD is most likely. Here again, from our own series, beautiful images actually, in which you see frontal hypometabolism, actually also some temporal hypometabolism, and here on the sagittal, it's very clearly seen. And again, here the Alzheimer's disease, this is the VBM tool, and here you see the difference between the normals and your particular patient, the anterior cingulate, and actually the frontal areas. Very, very clearly seen. Um, also, just to step a little bit out, FDG PET can be used to, to diagnose other uh, dementias. Cortical basal syndrome is asymmetric, as you can see, and with involvement of the basal ganglia. Huntington's disease, you see absence of any metabolism here in the caudate nucleus on both sides. Very important and a very useful diagnostic uh, adjunct, I think. And here, a DLB is, of course, this is not the, um, the particular investigation that you would do. The DOT scan is probably much more, uh, sort of, much better for this. But if you do FDG scan, there is something that we call the, the posterior island sign, actually, in which you don't see metabolism here in the occipital region. And this is quite characteristic for DLB. Uh, and here is just a, uh, uh, as we call, a very difficult one, and we missed it at, uh, the, when we saw it. Actually, this is a normal set of FDG scans, as you can see, and this is a particular patient. And we also thought that this scan was normal, uh, but the patient wasn't normal, but this was, uh, we thought was a normal scan. But if you look very closely, you see that there is actually uh, an absence of metabolism here in the basal ganglia region and actually no thalamic metabolism here. 
It's absolutely empty if you compare it to, for instance, those one. And here, as you can see here and here, you can see the difference. And this is known in prion disease, actually. And this was a fatal insomnia case that we had looked over a couple of times and we thought the FDG was normal. But if you look at this, this is Lancet Neurology Review, you see actually empty uh, thalamic uh, metabolism is very, very specific for prion disease. Kreutzfeldt Jakob, but also the other variants. So the biomarkers, you've seen this before, and this is a hypothetical model put forward by Cliff Jack, and I think this was the most used slide at the last ICAT in Paris. Actually, all the talks had this particular slide in it, um, but it is a useful slide. But remember, it's hypothetical. We do not know, know yet exactly whether this is correct. But what it says here is that I've mentioned FDG PET, I've mentioned MRI, I've mentioned CSFV beta, cognitive performance, etc. And you see within this trial that the amyloid changes are probably the, the first to uh, sort of occur in the whole disease trajectory. And tau, MRI, and cognitive disturbances become, come later. We talked about CSF. So can you image amyloid? And yes, you can with C11 PIP. And PIP is an um, invention by the Pittsburgh University. It's actually the second compound. It was first PIA, number A, that failed, and number two was PIP. And this is a, a also a huge success. And what they did is the first study, actually 2004, in collaboration with a Swedish group, you actually saw what Alzheimer saw through his microscope, you can now see in vivo. You see the amyloid where it is. And at first people were a little bit surprised because there was quite a predominance of amyloid in the frontal cortex, which we didn't know exactly from pathology that it happened. But if you read the literature more carefully, you see that there's also amyloid sort of plaques deposition in the frontal area. So probably it's correct. And here is our own, uh, these are our own uh, studies. And I think here you, you, you really need not be a nuclear medicine physician or, or any physician actually. Even my neighbor could sell, tell the difference between a control and a patient. This is so black and white. This is so easy. And this is because C11-PIP is really very powerful and really very sensitive. But beware, C11-PIP you can only do when you have a cyclotron. And very, not all hospitals have their own cyclotron. The half-life time of C11 is only 20 minutes. So you make the C11, which is difficult. Within 20 minutes, you lost already half. So it's only in research settings that this is to be used. And this is what we have done for the last uh, few years. This is a, a, a study actually comparing another amyloid ligand, which was uh, sort of developed here in Los Angeles, not very far from here. FDDMP also claimed to be an amyloid ligand, but we showed actually that this is FDDMP, that it wasn't a good amyloid ligand. Probably it's even a better tau ligand because it lights up much more in the medial temporal region and not in the, not in the parietal regions. So we could, we, because we have a cyclotron, we were able to compare all these um, uh, uh, amyloid ligands. And we looked at correlations, and indeed PIP correlates very, very well with CSFA beta they actually give the same signal. What you see on your PIP is what you see in your CSF, a change in amyloid, and especially amyloid beta 42. Is it predictive in MCI? There are some studies, and I will show you ours, and in this study we did actually repeated PIP over time. Here, if you look at MCI, so these are controls, and they have a, a very low value, actually, of the binding of PIP. And here are the Alzheimer patients. They're very high, as you can see. The difference is, again, black and white. There's almost no overlap. But here in between, you have the MCI patients. And as was discussed this morning, you see MCI patients who have a normal scan and MCI patients who have a very abnormal scan, a dichotomy almost. And if you follow these patients up with a repeated MRI, a repeated PIP, actually, we follow and we zoom in on the MCI patients. You see here at baseline the normal group, and here's the abnormal group. And if you, of the abnormal group after Two years, actually, the ones who actually had an abnormal PIP scan to start with, most of them actually converted clinically also to Alzheimer's disease. So it was predictive, as you can see, except one who had by the second scan had also abnormal scan, but clinically was still MCI. That's possible, so you have to wait and follow them longer. Interestingly, of two of the, of the MCI patients who had a normal PIP scan actually turned out two years later to have no MCI at all. So they reverted back to normal. So also a negative predictive value. 
And if you, this is an interesting patient. He started out normal with a PIP who was normal. And after three years' time, actually, the PIP started to be almost abnormal. And I can show you, this is the baseline scan of this particular patient, and this is the three-year follow-up, and you see the changes over time. You see almost no amyloid binding, and you see here amyloid binding. But clinically, this particular patient is still MCI. So indicating that it may take a long time, actually, going from normal to amyloid deposition and to clinical dementia may take three, five, even ten years. And uh, this patient we will follow up, of course. A couple of uh, non-Alzheimer's dementias. Uh, the Gil Rabinovici showed that also in FTD patients, and again, the same as we said with the CSF, there may be clinical FTD patients who have actually an abnormal PIP scan. So they may have Alzheimer's disease mimicking FTD clinically. Important diagnosis. This is also Parkinson's disease with dementia, a normal PIP scan, and dementia with Lewy bodies, also you have, you can have concomitant Alzheimer's disease pathology in DLB. I think Jeff will tell you this this afternoon also. And there is, there is nothing clinically wrong with you if you make that diagnosis, but beware, there are multiple pathologies that can occur in one patient, and you can tease them out using these sort of biomarkers. So what we're really excited is going from C11 PIP, which is a research tool with 20 minutes half-life time, which is impractical, we now are seeing the first amyloid ligand, which is fluor-based, just like FDG, and it has a half-life time of 24 hours. So you can make it in Los Angeles and ship it to Las Vegas or vice versa and still be in time to put it into the patient. And this will really open up amyloid diagnostics using PET in every town with the nuclear medicine department. And this is very important, although the costs are, of course, an issue. Important is that it is not that black and white as with PIP. This is, in fact, um, a, a sort of grading scale. This is a normal scan. This is a little bit abnormal, more abnormal. This is very abnormal. But you can appreciate that somehow the fluor PIP, yeah, the fluor amyloid ligand actually has a sort of a more of a gradient to it not like the PIP being black and white, normal, abnormal. This means that it's also more difficult to appreciate. And that's why the FDA required that Lilly, who is selling this one, needs to impl in place, employ actually a training program, an education program, and you can do it online actually. But it is very, very vital because it is, I have seen many of those, it's not that easy as you think. What is very nice about it, and what is needed, of course, what the FDA needed was two things. Retest, reliability. Is it the same picture if you do the patient another time, a week later, or a day later, or, uh, or a couple of weeks later? Yes, it is. Same patient, tested once, a couple of days later, exactly the same image. Very important. We, we sometimes forget that these sort of things are very, very important to do for a, a test, a biomarker test. A control patient looks like a control patient a couple of days later. So test retest reliability, but the ultimate thing that swayed actually the FDA to approve this ligand was the compelling evidence from pathology that indeed an, FD, an, an image, beta image, was sort of giving you the neuropathology in vivo. These were patients who were scanned, um, nursing home patients who were scanned, well, just prior to death, to put it mildly, and um, after that, they were sort of um, um, histopathologically uh, looked at, and you can see an abnormal floor beta base scan, a lot of amyloid, a normal floor beta base scan, no amyloid, and this is an, an intermediate scan actually with an intermediate amount of amyloid. This is really very, very interesting and compelling proof that what you see in your image is actually happening in the brain, and we needed that sort of information. And this is another one, this is flutamatamol, which is actually made by GE, the manufacturer of PIP also, and you can appreciate, also not that simple. This is a normal scan, but you have to you look very closely. It's a subcortical, a specific binding that you shouldn't look at, and it, it's the cortical specific binding that you should look at. So in, in fact, these, these fluor markers have more a specific binding, which makes it difficult to look at. So what are we looking at? The future of diagnosis. What we do now is clinical criteria that we still use, and we allow that to the diagnosis. And what we are moving to is allow biomarkers into the diagnostic framework, and we sort of use biomarkers to 
ensure ourselves that the patient has an underlying AD pathology, making it more specific than it has ever been. So this is very exciting, in fact, and it, it, it opens up, I think, the avenues to really test new promising drugs in a proper population with as less false positive as you can, um, as you can imagine. So just to conclude, I think I've, I've made my point that modern diagnostic sort of uh, workup needs biomarkers, but you need to treat them carefully. You need to know the pros and cons, and you need to trust your laboratory for CSF. I didn't touch on the standardization issue for CSF, which is very important. You need to trust your nuclear medicine physician to give you an accurate, not only volumetric MRI image, but also the PET image, of course. And I think there is more studies needed with pathology but there's also more studies needed in the differential diagnosis. We need to know more how the PET scan behaves, for instance, in all these differential diagnoses of AD. If you want to read this all, if you think, well, this was too difficult, I want to read it again, then I can advise you the Neuroimaging Dementia book that Frederick Barkov and Nick Fox and I put together and is on sale, actually, by Springer. And just to end and give you an outlook on all the ladies that actually helped me doing all this research, uh, I, I sort of dare you to find one, one man in this particular picture, uh, except myself. Uh, there are very few, but I'm very happy that they work with me. Thank you very much. <laughs>